Shalom Israel, giving honor and praise to the Most High God for the reading and the understanding of his word and family. Y'all already know this is my favorite time of the week. Y'all already know who you know. I cannot go without saying this. I want to wish every king, every queen, every prince, and every princess, I want to wish you a wonderful, magnificent Sabbath. And once again, thank you for bringing this in with your brother this week. And family, speaking of royalty, speaking of royalty, family, I just want to let everybody know right now that the discussion for the Royal Gathering Part 2 that Queen Tanya went ahead and entitled The Love Gathering. And I love that title. I absolutely love it. So the talks are in discussion right now. And I'm just going to leave it there. I don't want to put too much information out, but I'm just letting you know that we are getting prepared to do this again. So of course, I will keep everybody up to date with all of the information as it becomes available. And of course, y'all will be the absolute first to know. Now, family, family, family. <laughs> history. Israel's rich history. Now, remember a couple of weeks I told y'all that I wanted to get more into talking about the history of our people. Now, there's something I want to go ahead and I want to make a mention of. We have to stop and put the halt on other people telling us our history. Our history comes right here from our book, the Bible. And I can't read out of that one because the words are too little and I'm blind. So that's why I, I use this here, I use the app. But we have to stop allowing the other nations to tell us about our history. So first and foremost, let me explain something here really quick. When it comes to Esau, now y'all already know them and their curriculum, their little evil curriculum, right? They have actually convinced our people that we are nothing more than a bunch of bone in the nose, naked savages that they went over there and stole, collected from the jungles of Africa and brought us over here to be slaves. Now, of course, y'all already know that's not true. It's not true at all. We were a kingdom of greatness that was actually disgraced and had curses put on us by the most high and we fell from our glory. Bottom line, that's, that's the history. Now, there are so many of our people that just won't understand that. They don't understand it. They don't get it because the very first thing that they do, they say, ah, oh, you know, when there's one of us, one of our people, male or female, king or queen, prince or princess, that will go to someone that is still out there in that world and try to tell them, you know that we are truly the biblical Israelites. And what's the first thing they do? Oh, nah, 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 nah. Y'all niggas in a cult. Get out of my face with all that bull. <laughs> Y'all know how they do. Y'all know how they do. They'll discredit us in a heartbeat. But as soon, as soon as Esau tell them that they are the biblical Israelites and all of a sudden, oh, <laughs> tell me more master. And that's how they get sickening. It's stupid. It's disgusting. I can't stand it. It's gay, but they do it though. So there may be some of you that still have that in them, or you're probably watching for the first time. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to allow Esau to tell you that you are the biblical Israelites because for whatever reason, they have a, a more accreditation than we do when we do it. So here we go. Without any further ado, let's let the white man tell our people that we are the biblical Israelites. Here we go. Part of the reason why black churches don't teach this is because they don't want to get in the struggle either. They don't want to make it, quote unquote, racially motivated. People, this has nothing to do with racially oriented. I'm going to say that again. This has nothing to do with being racially oriented. This is biblical. Amen. I'm going to repeat that. This is biblical. Amen. These are biblical people. If they weren't, why are they in the Bible? If, if God didn't want you to see this, then why did he write it? 
He did it because it has to do with his story. I'm saying your forefathers. Now walk with me. Walk with me. Don't miss this. Because 98% of everybody out there believes that their root starts in Africa. So they call themselves black African Americans. And really what they should be talking to themselves is they are what? The Hebrews and the Jews of the original temple of the city of David. Amen. And the Dekenti de 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 cloth that you find in this, in, that most black culture uses as African cloth is the center cloth that was used in Solomon's temple and his mobile moving tabernacle. So where did you get that cloth from? Moses' mobile moving tabernacle. How did Moses get it? Because he was married to Zipporah and also an Ethiopian woman and etc. Now do you get the picture? All right. So now that some of your masses have told you exactly who you are, we are about to get into this lesson. So family, please open your Bibles to the 1611 King James Version Bible with the Apocrypha. And we are going to be reading from the book of Nehemiah. Now, of course, if y'all have been walking with me in this troop for quite some time, y'all know Nehemiah, that's my dude. I love Nehemiah. I do, I do, I do. And speaking of Esau, let me go back to them real quick. Let me talk about Esau here. Do y'all realize how stupid they really are? Just thinking about the, the concept of them telling us that we're nothing but a bunch of naked, bone-in-the-nose savages that they came over, collected, and stole and brought over here. So let's talk about what they present with their history. Now, they said that they evolved from monkeys. Okay, this is their history. And through that evolutionary process, it took them millions upon millions upon millions of years to become civilized. But when it comes to our people, the bone in the nose, African, naked little booty scratches that were over there in Africa without no civilization, no culture, it took from... 1619 Jamestown, uh, Jamestown, Virginia to the 1800s to become civilized? You see how stupid they are? Even when they try to be intelligent, even when they try to spew their lies, they still look dumb. They still look idiotic because it took them millions of years to evolve, but it took us 200 years. <laughs> You can't make this up, family. You truly, truly can't. So it means that it took 200 years for us to outcook them, to outshine them, to outdo them in just about everything that we do, outshine them, outswag them. 200 years. So even as they try to degrade us, even in the degradation of our people, they still lift us up. All praises to the most high. That's what they get for being stupid, dumb people. Okay. So again, we are going to be starting Nehemiah chapter one. All right, family. So let's go ahead and do it. Let's do this. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hekaliah. And it came to pass in the month of, Chislau, in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan, the palace. So let me stop for a second, because, you know, we got to break everything down as we go. So now, as you see right here, like I told y'all a couple of weeks ago, the Most High always gives us the timeline, and the timeline can be 100% verified. The Father gave us all the dates, the time frames, the whole nine yards. You know what that's called? That is called historical documentation. And the father put it right here in the scriptures for us. And I'm telling you right now, Esau, they have all of our documents. If you want to find it, you can start in the catacombs of the Vatican because that's where they have everything. All right, verse two. That Hanani, one of my brethren, came he and certain men of Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity 
con and concerning Jerusalem. So now let's put them brakes on. So even all the way back during the time of Nehemiah, we were in captivity. Just like the Bible says. All the way back then, all the way until right now. Captivity. And who are the ones in captivity? Who are the ones in slavery? The Jews. So, of course, it just goes to let you know that these so-called Ashkenazi Jewish people, that those are not the true Israelites. According to the scriptures. And they were in captivity. In Jerusalem. <laughs> people ain't there. All right. Verse three. And they said unto me, the remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. Just like them curses say in Deuteronomy. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down and the gates thereof are burned with fire. So now we got to set the stage. We got to make sure that you can really see what's going on. So here you have our brother Nehemiah. All right. Another one's brethren Hanani. But right now, speaking of Nehemiah, Nehemiah is looking around and he is seeing this great city of Jerusalem burned down to the ground in ruins, in ashes. Because remember, we are a people of royalty. So you can imagine how those palaces looked. You can imagine how great and fruitful that land truly, truly was. But because we continue to sin and go against the Most High, the Father allowed those great buildings to fall and collapse and are, and, and are in fire and in ruin. Now, of course, as King Solomon said, there is absolutely nothing new under the sun. So can we actually fast forward in time and think about a flourishing city, cities flourishing, built by our people that were destroyed and taken down by our enemy? We can start in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Start there. Uh huh. Because as Solomon said again, there's nothing new under the sun. It just goes to show you that is that is our people. Okay. Verse four. And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept. What's on my microphone? Get out of here. That I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Verse five, and said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. So as you see, this always goes right back to keeping the commandments. You see, when Nehemiah brought this out, he made sure that he referenced, first and foremost, the God of our people, the God of our brethren. And he acknowledges that we broke his commandments. You see, that's what you have to do when you stand in front of the Most High. You have to acknowledge your faults. You have to acknowledge your guilt. Yes, Father, I'll come to you humbly. I'll come to you with face down. Verse six, let thine ear now be attentive. You see how he talks to the most high? Not disrespectful, but bold saying, father, I need you to listen. Let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now day and night for the children of Israel thy servants and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned. So remember, as we started reading, we're talking about 
the house of Judah. You see this? Nehemiah is not only praying for himself, he's praying for everybody, which is exactly how we need to be doing it. As we go to the Father, Father, I know that we are a rebellious people. Father, I know we have sinned against you, but please hear my prayers. Please, Father. Verse 7. We have dealt very corruptly against thee and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments, which thou commandest thy servant Moses. So he's going right back, just like we talked about earlier. Moses gave us the commandments. And the father said, if y'all don't keep my commandments, Moses, you better tell them. You better let them know. If they don't keep my commandments, I'm going to put them in captivity. I'm going to put them in turmoil. And I'm going to wear them out. I'm going to take away their heritage, the whole nine yards. And you are experiencing right now as we read this with Nehemiah having that heritage removed. Them palaces are not there. He's looking at this city in ruins. But now when we look at us, we are so far removed from this here that it is absolutely ridiculous. We don't even know who we are, at least Nehemiah and them. They knew who they were. But today, our people have absolutely no idea. <laughs> we are a bunch of bone in the nose, naked savages. And we should be kissing the white man's ass for bringing us over here and giving us jobs and employment and the worst of the worst pig. The father told us he would do that. Verse eight. Remember, I beseech thee the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, if ye transgress, meaning sin, if ye transgress, I will scatter you abroad amongst the nation. So again, this is reading about our history. And the father said, I'm going to take y'all. I'm going to scatter y'all all over the place. So just to show you, this isn't anything new. Just the difference in the future. The father said, I was going to put y'all on ships. Because remember right now, they are in Jerusalem. They are in the Holy Land, but the land has been disgraced. Just so that now, the father said, in the future, you will be able to make the connection by what Moses said. The very same people that is talking about back then are the very same people in the future that is going to be put in slavery, in captivity, on ships on ships, the slave ships, man. And that is exactly what happened. So you know, without a shadow of a doubt that you are the biblical Israelites. It does not take a white man to tell you that. The Bible tells you. And if any, if any type of stupid, dumb, ridiculous, lying pastor tried to tell you anything else, you open up this book and you show him or her of course, a female passes an oxymoron, but they just happen to exist. And said, scatter amongst the nations, verse nine, but if ye turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, though there were of you cast out unto the utmost part of the heaven, stop. Wait a minute now cast out into the utmost part of the heaven. What does that mean? We're not up there with the most high in the heavens. We're not with the most high up in the upper firmament. So what is it talking about? How can we be cast out to the utmost parts of heaven? Because heaven is also a conditional term. Heaven means rulership and they're not in rulership now. Right here on earth, heaven is here. And so is hell. It's right here. All right, I'm going to start again. But if ye turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, though there were of you cast out unto the uttermost part of the heaven, yet will I gather them from thence and will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set 
my name there. And as we know, if you've been walking with me in this truth, the place where the Most High set his name is in Jerusalem. And the Father said even to them all the way back then, our ancestors, all y'all got to do is keep my commandments and I will bring all of you back. That very same promise is made with us. And just to show you, that's how long it has been since we have been sinning against the Most High. Verse 10. Now, these are thy servants and thy people whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power and by thy strong hand. O Lord, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of of thy servant. So again, saying, Father, listen to me. Yes, I have humbled myself before you, but now please listen to what I have to say and to the prayer of thy servant. So there's more than one person that's praying who desire to fear thy name and prosper. I pray thee, thy servant this day and grant him mercy in the sight of this man for I was the king's cupbearer. So now Nehemiah is telling you about this king and it is not a king of Israel here. Yeah. They're in captivity. Now let's go to chapter two. I like chapter two, boy. You, you, oh yeah. Uh -huh. Chapter two says some things. And so being that we are speaking about the history we're going to do this in sections because I want your full undivided attention when we do this here. Okay. Nehemiah chapter two. And it came to pass in the month Nisan in the 20th year of Artaxerxes, the king, that wine was before him. And I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now I had not been before time sad in his presence. So let's break this down. So now Nehemiah is telling us that he is a cupbearer of the king. He serves him his wine. That was his occupation. But he's saying that he is so troubled and so bothered that in the presence of the king, he cannot deny his countenance. There is a sad heaviness on him that he can't even fake it. He, he can't fake the face. He can't wear a mask because he is burdened by what he saw with the kingdom of Jerusalem and how it has fallen. You see, that's how we should be feeling today. Verse 2. Wherefore the king said unto me, why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? So the king even noticed, he's like, hold on, yo, hold on, Nehemiah, you don't, you're not sick, but you look like you are. What's wrong? What's the matter with you? What's wrong? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. You see how much our forefathers love us? Then... I was very sore afraid and said unto the king, let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad when the city, the place of my fathers, the sepulchers lieth waste and the gates thereof are consumed with fire. So now Nehemiah don't care. He like, all right, look, I'm gonna look, let me talk to you real quick. He's saying, why should not be sad? Now I want you to understand the balls that Nehemiah now has. Cause he's like, yo, hold on a second. You know what? This king is, he's, he's not my brethren. All right. But I want to talk about my people and I'm looking around. Why should I not be sad watching you be in that seat? Why should I not be sad? Because we are the kings, queens, princes, and princesses of this land. But here you are sitting up here and my people have been disgraced and are ashamed and are looking with the fire that has consumed this place. I'm sad and I'm mad as hell. <laughs> All right. Verse four. Then the king said unto me, for what dost thou make request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. So the king asked him, okay, so what is Nehemiah? So what you want? So apparently this king, he liked Nehemiah. He said, all right, Nehemiah, what you want? So now, being that he asked him what he want, 
Nehemiah is like, all right, well, let me pray to my God real quick. Verse five. And I said unto the king, if it please the king, and if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldest send me unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchers, that I may build it. I don't think y'all understand what's going on right now. <laughs> A spiritual event is now taking place. So Nehemiah has this countenance over him. You see, the spirit of the most high is in Nehemiah now because he's like, wait a second now, hold up. Um, my people are down. I'm sick and tired of looking at this. I want to go rebuild Judah. Ooh. Every so-called Negro in here ought to be jumping up and down and pop locking right now because he just said, wait a minute, I want to go build Judah. I want to go build my people back. And our place. Verse 6. And the king said unto me, the queen also sitting by him, for how long shall thy journey be? And when wilt thou return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. So wait a minute now, what just happened? So now Nehemiah a commandment keeper and a lover of his people went to the most high before all this went down. That meant the most high heard him. So now the most high said, go talk to the king. Give him the balls. Go talk to him. You see how the most high is. Y'all see how he is. The father said, go, go talk to him. I got this. So in other words, Nehemiah, I want you to go build this city back. The most high gave him an assignment. He told him what he had to do. And obedient Nehemiah did it. And do you see how easy this was? The Most High didn't put him through no turmoil. He didn't put him through anything. He said, all right, nigga, go do it. Verse seven. Moreover, I said unto the king, if it please the king, let letters be given me to the governors beyond the river that they may convey me over till I come into Judah. So he's like, listen, I need you to write some letters. I don't think y'all understand what's going on here. Here you have a king and his queen that is sitting on a throne, but they're not the real ones. Nehemiah is calling the shot. Nehemiah calling the shots. He's telling the king and his queen what to do. Telling him, I'm getting ready to go out here, so you're going to protect me as I go. Oh, my goodness. Talking to the governors and everything. He's having them write power plays. Y'all going to see how all this turned out. I'm telling you, this is our history. It is so wonderful. It is so beautiful. Verse 8. And a letter unto Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of of the palace which appertained to the house and for the wall of the city and for the house that I shall enter into. And the king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. So I want you to understand that Nehemiah made sure that everybody knew when he's telling his story, all of this was done through the most high. So what does it say? Nehemiah is saying, all right, so father, I need you to please give me all the building material and make the king pay for it. Let this nigga pay for it. <laughs> Woo, y'all, oh man, 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 man. Do y'all see just how dope the most high really, really is? Y'all see that? Do y'all see the power that we truly have? Do y'all get it? Okay, let's continue. Then I came to the governors beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent captains of the army and horsemen with me. Oh my goodness gracious. So you mean that Nehemiah has so much favor with the most high? He said, not only am I going to let this king pay for, what would you call it today? An all inclusive trip. I'm going to have him pay for everything. And not only that, but I'm going to send his best out there with you to protect you. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. 
Oh my goodness. All right. <laughs> Verse 10. When Sambalah the Horonite and Tobiah the servant, the Ammonite, the Japanese, heard of it, it grieved them exceedingly <laughs> that there was come a man to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. So now you got to understand, they're like, yo, hold on a second. Whoa, 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 whoa. Because obviously the soldiers that are with them are not us because we are different looking people. Everybody knows when they see a so-called Negro, a Hispanic or a Native American. They know us. We differ from everybody else in, on, on this planet. And now you have one of those, for right now, let's talk about the Amorite, that little Japanese dude. They're like, hold on, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Oh, as look at the word, it said, grieve them. These niggas were mad. Ooh, they were mad. They're like, hold on a minute. Yo, why this nigga got all this protection? So to put this in, in today's terms, right? Let's just say it was one of you and you have the Russian army backing you up on your side. <laughs> That's what this is in today's terms. And it pissed them off that this one so-called Negro, this, the children of Israel, that they're one of them walking around with that much power. All praises to the Most High God. Verse 11. So I came to Jerusalem and was there three days. And I arose in the night. I and some few men with me, neither told I any man what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. Neither was there any beast with me, save the beast that I rode upon. So if you're not getting this here, and it's about to get good, or it's about to get good. So now the father said, don't tell nobody what you're doing. And you see, I want to make this very clear to you. Stop telling everybody your business. Stop telling everybody your dreams. Stop telling everybody your thoughts. It ain't none of their business. Because everybody is not for you. Just because some people may smile in your face, just because some people may be aligned with you in a narrative does not mean that they have the best intentions for you. So keep that to yourself. And that's biblical. So now watch this family. And I went out by night by the gate of the valley, even before the dragon well and to the dung port and viewed the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down and the gates thereof were consumed with fire. Let me ask you a question here, family. Let's read this one part again. And I went out by night, by the gate of the valley, even before the dragon well. The dragon well. So you mean to tell me again that here we are bringing out the scriptures and when it comes to the children of Israel, there's the mentions of dragons again. So, some of y'all, y'all need evidence. You need evidence, right? I'm going to give you some evidence. Just by today's standards. So, without any further ado, family, let me go ahead and show you this clip right here. Here we go.
human dragon. I thought your species was extinct. It seems we're both prisoners. I don't know who Draven treats worse. Humans and dragons. Marco, you said that peasants could never win a rebellion. But what about peasants and dragons? Right. Okay. So let me ask you a question. In their own film and literature, why did they have this old big old black man with this dragon? <laughs> why? Because Esau knows our history. They want to beat us so bad, but they just cannot help telling the truth with certain things that this big black man right here, his brother, have a dragon right at his disposal. It's not mythical. That's why when you watch all of those shows like Game of Thrones, any of those old King Arthurish type shows, they always have dragons, Dungeons and Dragons, How to Train My Dragon, all these things, all these things. And uh, did y'all see Dungeons and Dragons? Who was in Dungeons and Dragons? And who was the man in the movie? It was Marlon Wayans. Marlon Wayans. Yeah. Black man. Judah. That's right. They can't help telling. They can't, they can't help it. <laughs> and I showed that to show you that first and foremost, they know our history. 
They know what's up with us and they want to be us so bad. They want our lives so bad, but they just can't have it. Everything that happens with them, they have to create in a movie studio. They have to create with CGI, but with us, it really happened. Telling y'all, <laughs> all right, verse 14. Then I went on to the gate of the fountain and to the king's pool, but there was no place for the beast that was under me to pass. Stop. Getting a little further into this. What was Nehemiah? What did Nehemiah have with him, family? Now, we all know that the scriptures, it mentions horses, it mentions swines, it mentions dogs, it mentions all these things, but just here, two verses up, it mentions dragons. He was riding on a dragon. This is why I said our history is so awesome. They taught us. They convinced us that these creatures don't exist. It's all mythological. But when you actually open the Bible and start to read it, you see exactly what this is. A camel cannot be a dragon because it does not breathe fire and it doesn't have scales. So what Esau did, they went ahead and they called certain of these things. They gave them a term back in the 1800s. They called them dinosaurs. But that's not what they are. The Bible calls them dragons. Just as when we read in Job, when the Most High was putting his foot in between the ass cracker Job because he wanted to get smart and nippy with him, what did the Most High point out to Job? He said, look at Behemoth, this big, strong, with bones of iron beast that I created. Job was standing right there next to Behemoth. Just as Nehemiah is right here with his dragon. So if anybody think I'm going off course. This is our history, baby. This is what it is. And this history will be coming back. Remember, the father said, I am going to remove y'all from your heritage for your disobedience. But when the time comes back, when this earth is restored to better than what it was before, yes, you will have your dragons. I know some of y'all, y'all want lions and everything like that. That's cool. That's cool. But for me, I'll take about two, three, ten of them dragons. Bring them to me. Bring them to me. I'm telling y'all, whoo, man, 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 if y'all only understood, I, 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 I hope y'all get it. I hope y'all get it. Now let's continue. Verse 15. Then when I up in the night, excuse me, then went I up in the night by the brook and viewed the wall and turned back and entered by the gate of the valley and so returned. And the rulers knew not whither I went or what I did, neither had I as yet told it to the Jews, nor to the priests, nor to the nobles, nor to the rulers, nor to the rest that did the work. He still kept his mouth shut. Then said I unto them, ye see the distress that we are in now. He's talking to people. Do y'all understand that the, the circumstances, the distress that we are in? Let me start this over. Then said I unto them, ye see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lieth waste and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come, come and let us build up the wall of Jerusalem 
that we be no more a reproach. You see, Nehemiah had an issue with knowing first and foremost who he is, knowing who the priests are, knowing who his people are, and said, we are going to build our city back up. You see, people understood the importance of Jerusalem. Nehemiah is sickening him to see Jerusalem in the condition that it's in now. And it is so scary that with us, we don't give a damn about Jerusalem over there because there was a certain people that moved over there and stole our identity and said that they were the Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. We don't care nothing about Jerusalem. But as we get in these scriptures, as we know our history, hopefully this is going to ignite a fire in you to learn more about Jerusalem and see over there and know that that place is in ruins and that we have to get back over there and we start rebuilding from right here and how do we do that nehemiah gave us the blueprint by us keeping the commandments baby that's what it is that's what we have to do we must keep the commandments of the most high this is serious business nehemiah wasn't feeling it he's pissed then i told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me. See, Nehemiah knew. Nehemiah understood, I keep the commandments, I'm good with the Most High. And that's where our brains have to be as well. We have to be there to know when we keep the commandments, the Most High is looking down on us, looking upon us and hearing our prayers. Then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me, as also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. He had everybody working, not just our people. He had everybody working. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the servant the Ammonite and Geshem the Arabian heard it, they laughed us to scorn and despised us and said, what is this thing that ye do? Like, what are y'all niggas doing? Will ye rebel against the king? Then answered I them and said unto them, the God of heaven, he will prosper us. Therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build. But ye have no portion, nor right, nor memorial in Jerusalem. What did Nehemiah just do? Family, what did Nehemiah just do? Nehemiah just told them niggas, yo, mind your business. You have no place here. Do you see just how strong he was able to come with that? He said, nigga, you don't got no place here. Neither one of y'all. And just as always, they laughed at us and they mocked us. Now, do y'all remember at the royal gathering <laughs> when I showed the video of the Chinese as our people got off the bus and they were sitting there yelling and mocking them. Remember? Nigga, nigga, get out of China. Remember that? They did the very same thing all the way back then. Nothing has changed. You better... Y'all better look in that mirror and be happy about who you are. Every morning you wake up and you take your first breath. You better be so glad and so happy that your black ass is an Israelite. I'm telling you, there's no greater honor on this planet. And so many of our people just don't care. They don't care. But the father did tell us you have the one third versus the two thirds, just like we talked about last week. The ones that matter versus the ones that don't. This over here is everything. The Illuminati over here, but over here worthless. No light coming from him. Darkness, light, light, darkness. You see how all of this goes together? It doesn't matter what book you go to, what scripts you pull out, it all correlates. They all tell the same story over and over and over. 
And so now that we brought that out, because that's where we're going to end, hopefully this is going to ignite a fire in you to continue to chapter three and go forth and go so on. Now that you have the understanding of it, you know who you are. Not only that, but for you to teach your sons and your daughters, your neighbors, your family, teach them who we are. There's not enough of us teaching. There's not enough of us bringing these scriptures out. This is our rich history and it is so rich and it is so beautiful. It is so dope. It truly, truly is. We serve such a wonderful, wonderful God. I don't understand how our people don't get this, but they're not educated. And you know why? Because there's not enough of us bringing this out. There's not enough of you sharing these lessons. I'm not saying that none of you do it, but some of you like to take this and hold it for yourselves. Some of you don't even have the balls to say, to go to your family and be like, you know what? Hey, I want to sit you all down and I want you to watch this lesson here just so that it can trigger something in somebody Everybody's not going to get it because remember, two thirds is the majority, one third is the minority. So a lot of people are going to die. A lot of people are going to look at you and say that you're in a cult and yada, yada, whatever. But what about that one? What about that one that Christ said, go back and get? That one. They're worth it. They are so worth it. But so many of us act like they're not. They're like, okay, you know, I don't want to go talk to nobody. You have a job to do. And you do. Remember, when you stand in front of the most high, all of your work is going to be accounted for. So either, well, this hand, this is the, the unrighteous over here. So either you are not going to do anything with your talent that the most high gave you to become a fisherman how to fish men. And you're not going to get everybody from over here. You're not. But you get that one. Maybe even two. But you won't get any if you don't try. Israel. I just want to take that and just embrace that one in. That was a beautiful lesson. I love that one. <laughs> I don't know about you. Yes, I said my lesson was beautiful. It damn sure was. And why was it beautiful? It had nothing to do with me. It had to do with them scriptures. It had everything to do with that. I love it. I love our history. And here we are, the very last day of the Passover. What a way to go out, huh? All throughout the week, we've been doing our history with the unleavened bread. And oh, man, some of y'all showed out with the unleavened bread too. Oh man, man, man. The creativity within Israel all the way. Oh man, the deep fried. <laughs> yeah, baby. The deep fried unleavened bread. Our people, we don't be playing. Oh, we don't be playing. Such a beautiful, beautiful people. Such a rich history. And it's... It, <laughs> Us as a people have been degraded, but, uh, but our history can't be. Isn't that beautiful? And all because of the God that we serve. So that's why you should have a jetpack on your back to rise up and go out and go do the things that the Most High told us to go do. We have to. We most certainly have to. And I just want to say this. Let me just be, I want to be very honest right now. I want to lay everything out. It is such an honor and a pleasure and I'm so thankful that every week I can come and do this here with you and you accept me in your homes and listen, I'm telling you, I want to thank, I want to personally thank each and every last one of you for giving me the opportunity to do something that I love and you listen. And hopefully when I do this, it is contagious so that you can do it also. But I do. Every once in a while, I have to look you dead in your eye right now and say, thank you. And I truly, truly mean that. I'm not saying that for no reason. I'm saying that because I truly mean it from the bottom of my heart. I thank the most high for those of you that have an ear to listen. Those of you that have the patience to deal with me. <laughs> and I mean that. And, uh, and again, I truly, truly 
Thank you. And of course, most importantly, every day, I thank the most high, just like you should do. All right. So family, I want y'all to continue on with the remainder of this Passover and enjoy this Sabbath day. Love each other, hug each other, embrace each other, teach each other. And most of all important, love each other. And with that being said, Israel, I'm out.